Hello and welcome. Thank you all for joining us today for this webinar. Uh, my name is Andy Last. I'm the media manager at Pure Financial Advisors. And today we're having a conversation on the financial markets as we approach the end of 2021. Today's conversation features Brian Perry, CFP, CFA, and Dominic Knopf, MBA of Pure Financial Advisors. All right, it's up to you guys. Brian, would you like to uh, start off with a poll or how would you like to kick things off today? Well, I'd like to start off by saying it's we've done a lot of these together andy but it's nice to have a partner we'll, we'll figure out if dom is batman or robin and which one i am but it's nice to have some teamwork here going forward uh, absolutely hopefully, hopefully all of our attendees are going to get two for the price of one here today and double the knowledge um we'll see if it doesn't go well guys i've done this a lot dom hasn't so it's his fault right just don't forget that <laughs> No, this is going to be great. We've got a, a lot to cover. What we want to do is make this interactive. Um, we've got a couple of polls to put up to ask you guys a few questions. Um, Dom and I are going to ask some questions, bounce some ideas around. And really the idea here to impart you with as much wisdom as we can in the next 45 minutes to an hour. Um, yeah, why don't we start with a poll, get things started here. All right. So uh, the first poll we'll kick things off with is how often do you watch CNBC or other financial news networks? And I am publishing that poll right now. Uh, like I said, if you're on a desktop computer, you'll see it on the right hand side of your screen. If you're looking on a phone, it'll be down at the bottom. And your options are, do you watch CNBC or other financial news networks daily, weekly, occasionally or never? So I'm going to leave that poll up for a few more seconds and we will close this poll up in get those answers in now in five, four three, two, I'm going to leave it for a couple more seconds because I see answers are still coming in. All right. And I'm going to close the poll right now. All right. So 24% of our audience is watching financial news networks on a daily basis. 7% watch weekly, 47% watch occasionally, and 20% say that they never watch the financial news networks. Okay. All right. Uh, it would be interesting to compare the investment returns of the never and the daily and see who's <laughs> actually doing better. Um, let's circle back to that in a moment. Let's go to, uh, to some of the questions or some of the topics we we're going to talk about. Right, Dom? Yeah, Brian, yeah. looking forward to the discussion today. As I was uh, thinking about it and preparing for it, uh, one of the things that I was thinking about was when uh, you and I first met. And one of the many things that really stood out to me is the fact that you've authored a book. Uh, in fact, not even just a book, you've offered authored three different books. Uh, quite a feat. Uh, curious, you know, what led you to, to, to author one, let alone three? You know, what was, that, what was that process and experience like? And maybe tell us a little about kind of the focus of the books as well. Yeah, well, you know, to be honest, writing one book is inspiration. Writing a second or a third is masochism uh, because it's a pretty painful process. Um, no, it's, you know, I joke, it's, it's obviously a lot of hard work, like a lot of things, uh, but it's really rewarding. And, and the idea behind all of them is that there's so much financial information out there. And this is why we asked about CNBC, right? Whether it's CNBC, Bloomberg, Forbes, et cetera, there's so much information out there. Um, the problem isn't finding information, it's finding out what's true and what isn't and cutting through the wheat, to, uh, the chaff to get to the wheat, right? And my, the idea behind all, everything I've written, and honestly, the idea behind everything Pure does, so it's not just books I've written, it's all the TV show that we do, the Your Money, Your Wealth TV show, the podcast, the radio, the seminars we run, the meetings we have with clients, or the free financial assessments we give to people that aren't clients, just to help better educate them. Really, the goal is to cut through all of the noise out there and get to what actually matters with people's finances. You know, the one book I wrote, the most recent one, is called Ignore the Hype. News in general is great. You just need to take it for what it's worth. It's entertainment and then information. The goal of CNBC and everybody else in the media game is to attract eyeballs. And the way that you attract eyeballs is not by coldly imparting rational information. It's by tugging on people's emotions. Um, watch CNBC someday. You'll see 150 breaking news headlines in bold, flashing up and down. Headline, headline, headline. And then it's like, a regional Federal Reserve president gave a speech in Denver and said nothing or something like that. Or, you know, oil inventories were up or down and it literally has no impact whatsoever on people's futures. Um, so that's really the goal of all the books is to help people. Yes, the media can help entertain. It can inform at the edges. Maybe you make tweaks to your portfolio, but it's to help people focus on what really matters. Brent, I know you watch the, uh, <clears throat> the markets closely uh, with your role here. And speaking of uh, some of these financial news networks, uh, I remember, you know, 18 months ago, I suppose now, when we really hit the, the lows uh, during the beginning of the uh, financial crisis of the, 
pandemic, uh, seeing all of those sensational headlines on uh, CNBC uh, and the like. Thinking back to that time and you know where the market was then, um, did you expect that here, 18 months later, uh, the market would be where it's at today? <laughs> You know, can I lie and say yes? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I'll be honest, right? I, I was surprised. Um, at no point during the fall from COVID did I think the situation was as bad as in the 2008-2009 financial crisis. In 2008 and 2009, the financial and banking system really was collapsing. The plumbing of the financial system, if you will, was really gummed up. And I, I believe um, based on a relatively front row seat at the time mm -hmm. to what was going on, um, that we were at the precipice of financial Armageddon. What happened in March of 2020 was a little bit different. It was a rational response to the fact that the economy was shut down, right? If Carnival Cruises can't run cruises, if United Airlines can't fly, if Denny's can't have people come to their restaurant, their business is shot. It makes sense to sell that stock, right? And so we saw a very sharp stock market sell-off. Um, a lot of times it's about selling initially you know, panicking, selling, and then a sharp recovery. That's a pretty typical pattern. What was somewhat unusual was how quickly we recovered. Um, and in fact, um, we're up basically double from the low. So that that did surprise me. I mean, I don't know, Dom, you've been doing this a long time. What were your thoughts at that time? Did, did you think we were going to have a sharp market recovery? You know, I, I didn't expect it would come back uh, quite this quickly. I, I can vividly remember uh, the you know, numerous times where they stopped trading on the market because it had fallen below its its breakpoint. So, but I think it's a good reminder of like, uh, in those moments, uh, you know, in irrational moments, we can act pretty irrationally. Uh, but to see where we're at today, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, due to some of the, the stimulus and spending that that's created, uh, we're, we're pretty resilient in, uh, I think, all ways as a country, uh, stock market included. Yeah, you know, and, and I think that there were some key takeaways from that too. I, Markets go up, markets go down, times are good, times are bad. Um, I, I think the difference probably in life in general between success and failure, and certainly when it comes to investing, is learning from the tough times, right? So it's like, okay, something happened. What do you learn? What do you take away from it? And I think the big takeaway from what was going on in March of 2020 was that having a plan in place, whether that's a full-blown comprehensive financial plan or at least an investment policy statement, which is basically a roadmap for how you're going to invest, Putting a rational plan in place at a time when you're calm and not emotional and then following that plan is way easier than figuring it out on the fly. Because, uh, you know, I've met a ton and, and Dom, I know you have too, people that got out, right? That, yeah. hey, maybe their allocation was 50-50 stocks and bonds and they panicked and got out. Um, and when you get out like that, only three things can happen. The, the market can go sideways, which, which okay. Um, the market keeps falling, right? But if you're afraid and so you pull out. If the market keeps falling, what are the odds you're gonna feel better when the news is worse? Or the market starts to rally and recover and now you know it's really hard to catch that train because you keep waiting for a pullback because now it seems very expensive. Um, so having that plan in place to say, hey, this is my allocation to different asset classes, different investments ahead of time. And then all, you, then all you're doing is you're just following the playbook. You're following the script. And maybe you know it's like an actor with some lines in a play. Maybe you improvise a little. So if you're really afraid because it's COVID or whatever, and again, if you were roughly 50-50, maybe you go to 45% or even 40% stocks, right? Not advising that, but maybe that's something that you do. Um, it might not be optimal, but it's a heck of a lot better. And it's still going to give you a chance of financial success versus if you just missed a 100% rally in the stock market, it's tough to catch up from. And I think equally as hard, you talked about kind of working the plan. I like your, I like your comments there. Uh, you know, those who, who sell when it's in a free fall like that, uh, from my experience too, uh, oftentimes have a have a tough time, you know, buying back in at the right time. So uh, have the plan, know your plan, work the plan. I like it. Yeah. And, and it's definitely easier to get out of markets than it is to get back in. Right. I, I mean, selling and, and it, honestly, selling might be the right move. You know what I mean? If the market falls 15 percent because X, Y, Z happened and you sell, um, that may very well be the right move because the stock market could fall another 20 percent. And then you can run a victory lap, right? Hey, I sold, I got out, I, you know, brilliant. Um, the challenge always is getting back in, right? And so it doesn't really lead to a lot of success. There's no glory in selling because the market's down 10%, seeing it fall another 10, and then it goes up 50% and you never bought back in, right? You're worse off than you have just ridden the down, the down cycle and then experienced the upturn. That's where, again, that asset allocation comes in with having enough safe investments so you can sleep at night.
You know, and when you think about different asset classes or different investments, you've got things like stocks or real estate or commodities maybe that are there for growth down the road. Um, but you've also got whether it's cash or bonds or whatever, the, the, really the boring investments, they're there to help you sleep at night so that you're not staring at the ceiling worried about your finances. But they're also there to allow you to hold on to the growth assets when things are bad. Because over time, those growth assets will get you to your financial goals if you don't panic and sell. The safe assets are there to make sure you don't panic and sell. Right. I want to go back to the, the markets in a little bit. But uh, <clears throat> maybe before we do, there's a Another topic that we're hearing a, a lot of questions around, and, and that's inflation. Yeah. Um, and I'll I'll uh, I'll share with you a little story here as we as we kind of get into it that, that made it uh, made it I think you know uh, real for me or or made me question it certainly. Uh, it wasn't long ago, maybe a month ago or so. Uh, we came back in town from a trip. My I have three kids. My wife was out with my younger two. Uh, I had some commitments that I was out at in my oldest child, my 13 year old daughter was, was home and uh, there wasn't really much in the fridge. So she reached out to me and, and uh, wanted me to uh, get her some dinner. I wasn't gonna be able to get home in time. So I opened up my phone, uh, <clears throat> uh, went to one of the meal delivery places and uh, she's usually a pretty clean eater. So you get a little dad guilt here, but uh, she decided she wanted a value meal from McDonald's. So I ordered her value meal to be delivered to the house because I wasn't gonna get there in time. Simple value meal, right? no super size, no nothing, no extras. It was like $21.83. And it was the moment I thought, if we aren't experiencing inflation right now, uh, I don't know what just happened. But in my childhood, I, I thought every value meal was under $5. Uh, is that a sign that, that inflation is here and inflation is real? And the scary part there is those are Minnesota prices, right? So we're sitting now in San Diego, that $21 meal would probably be 35 bucks or something like that. No kidding. Um, no, I, I mean, you know, it, it's funny because I, I hear the same thing, right? And honestly, I'm susceptible to it where I, I go to the movies and I still feel like it's going to be $7 and it's 15, right? So, um, yes, over time, things get more expensive. If you look since World War II, the cost of living in the United States is up about 12 or 13 X. So things over time do get more expensive. Um, and that's okay as long as it's gradual. Um, and inflation has been pretty muted. A lot of people remember the 1970s or the 1980s when we had double digit inflation. And that was really harmful to the economy. Um, and that people worry that we're going to go back to that. Um, but if you look in the last 30 years, you're looking at more like 4%, 5%, 6%, 3%, 1%. So much more muted levels. Um, we went probably 15 years, a dozen years maybe, with 1%, 2%, 3% percent inflation. And now recently we've seen a spike up. I think the big issue right now for that financial markets are trying to figure out and economists are trying to figure out is, is the jump in inflation transitory or is it more permanent and sticky? And what that means is there's an element of inflation that's driven by COVID, right? When you think about COVID, there's all these supply chain constraints. Uh, you can't get a used car because, or a new car because there's no semiconductors to run them because the factory was shut down. Lumber prices soared which led to soaring home prices or soaring you know, cabinet prices because you couldn't import trees from Canada or something like that. So those are temporary effects that are leading to higher prices. If that's all it is, is temporary, it's not a big deal. I think the worry is what if it's not temporary? What if it's permanent? And what might cause it to be permanent? Well, a couple things. One is the increase in minimum wage that we've seen in a lot of different places. And you know, it may or may not be a good thing for some people or for the economy, but when you think about it, um, People that are close to minimum wage, uh, if you look statistically, tend to pay, tend to spend 100% of their income. So if you increase their income by you know by two x, if you take them from eight dollars an hour to fifteen to sixteen dollars an hour, um, they're likely going to go spend that. Those are more dollars competing for the same amount of goods. That's the definition of inflation. So I think that's one thing people worry could be inflationary. The other is government spending. There's a big fear that hey, the government's printing money to cover trillion multi trillion dollar deficits. What is the long-term impact of that? Um, you know, I, I don't know the answer. My personal view, and this is just speculation, is that I don't think inflation is going back to, you know, one or 2%. I also don't think we're spiking to the 1970s. I think the truth, and this has been my view, honestly, for a while, since well before COVID, I think we're going back to maybe a new normal where three to five or three to 6% inflation is more common than one or 2% inflation. Um, 
based on a, based on a number of things, but I don't think that needs to be bad for investors. Um, and when you think about it, there's different asset classes that you can invest in that have different resiliencies to inflation. Um, and it's really about figuring out how inflation is going to impact your particular portfolio. Supply and demand can be yeah, pretty fickle. And right now where we have so many challenges within the supply uh, chain, uh, demand boosts up and you know, lack of supply, increased demand. Uh, yeah, we're seeing prices push up and we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, but is that permanent? Uh, is it temporary? Uh, really good question. Uh, along those lines, I feel like a topic we've been talking with people uh, often a, about for the last many, many years is, is interest rates. And there's uh, all of this thought that interest rates are, are ultimately going to go up. Maybe, you know, many have predicted that for, for years. Uh, you know, do you have a, a take on that, Brian? Do you think that that's something that we're going to start to see here uh, pretty soon? Or do you think we're going to stay in a, in a, you know, relatively low interest rate environment for an extended period of time. Yeah. So, um, you know, I spent the first half dozen years of my career as a bond trader in New York. And then from there was an institutional bond portfolio manager for seven or eight years after that. So um, as you can imagine, I've talked about interest rates once or twice in my life. Um, you know, the idea that interest rates, first of all, the idea that interest rates have to go higher is a, is a fallacy. So I just want to put that to rest. And, and maybe some of you will believe that some of you won't. Um, Japan has had sub 1% interest rates for the better part of three decades. And back when I started my career more years ago than I care to remember, it was in the mid 90s, um, there was something even back then known as the stretcher trade. And the idea behind the stretcher trade was that Wall Street traders were betting that Japanese interest rates had to go higher and they were losing their shirts on it and getting carried off the trading floor on a stretcher because it was killing them. This was in the mid 90s after half a dozen years of low interest rates there. Flash forward, you've got another 25 years of really low interest rates. So interest rates don't have to go higher. There's no law saying they have to. Um, now, will they is another question, right? But they don't have to, right? Will interest rates go higher? Um, I think they will to a degree. But again, it's a matter of degrees. I don't think we're going back to the 1970s or the 1980s. I don't think if we just focus on the 10-year treasury, which is kind of the most common benchmark, I don't think we're going back to... Um, double digit rates. I don't think we're going back to eight or 9%. Um, I think what you'll see is in the short term, the, the range has been basically a half a percent to 3%. Uh, you know, right now we're basically smack dab in the middle at right around one and a half percent. I think that's probably fair. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if over time we inch up back towards two or two and a half. Um, but I don't see an impetus for rates to spike. If you stretch that horizon out longer over the course of years, I think that you know, somewhere in the three to 5% range could eventually become uh, a range for treasuries. So I think that we'll get back to more meaningful yields, but I don't think they'll be dramatically higher. Um, there, there's several reasons for that. If we circle back to the last question around inflation, inflation and interest rates are closely linked. And it's important to remember that interest rates don't lead to higher inflation. It's the opposite. Inflation will lead to higher interest rates. So all else being equal as a bondholder, you're going to demand more compensation from your treasury bond or any kind of bond if inflation is higher because that inflation is eating away at your purchasing power. So we see a little bit higher inflation. We will likely see somewhat higher interest rates. But again, I don't think they're going to spike. The other thing I think is really important to remember, and people forget this all the time, is if you own bonds, you know, if you need the money tomorrow, it's one thing, right? But assuming you've got some sort of reasonable time horizon, rising interest rates are the single best thing that can happen to you, right? Everybody... It, it's interesting because think of how many news headlines for those of you watching CNBC or reading the press, um, the newspaper, whatever it is, how much time in the last decade has been spent talking about rising interest rates as if it's the boogeyman. And the reality is, is what do rising interest rates mean to you as a bond investor? It means you just got a pay raise. Imagine if the whole country for the last decade was worried about getting a pay raise at work, right? It sounds crazy. But as a bondholder, your portfolio is constantly turning over. If interest rates go up, there might be a little bit of short-term pain, but ultimately it means your paycheck went up. That's a good thing. So Brian, we just talked about all the, all the stuff, you know, the uh, financial uh, networks out there talking about all this stuff and they blasting out, you know, the pandemic and, and how do we react to the pandemic and, oh, there's inflation coming. How do we manage inflation and what are interest rates going to do? And you know, general investor out there, you know, tries to take it all that information and make their own bets and their own predictions. And that so commonly leads to, to many mistakes. We've kind of seen all of the, the stats on it. Uh, but, you know, what's your take on what 
causes so many of those stakes, mistakes. And you know, as, as a professional who's made a, a career out of this for more than 20 years, uh, you know, what's, what's your trick uh, to not making so many of those same mistakes? Yeah. Um, you know, in a word, the, I, I think the reason that people make mistakes and by mistakes, um, it could be getting out of the market. It could be incorrectly timing the market. Um, I, I think that honestly, there's two things. Um, one is just a sense that, um, that we know more than the financial market. And, and if you think about it, it, sometimes that could be true. There might be a unique insight that somebody has into a company or a market that nobody else has. Uh, but you need to honestly assess your chances, right? You know, if you're thinking of Apple or if you're thinking of a treasury bond, there are literally hundreds of millions of people and billions or even trillions of dollars going into forming a valuation of what's that worth. Um, if you know more than every hedge fund in the country or the world, more than Goldman Sachs, more than JP Morgan, more than huge pension funds and insurance companies that are investing in those things about what that asset is worth, then maybe you can outwit them and, and you know be correct as far as whether it's worth more or less than what the market's saying. Um, but I, I think you need to honestly assess whether or not you truly have that unique insight. So I think that's one thing. Um, the other, and I'd be interested to get your thoughts on this, Dom, is just emotions. You know, I, I think that um, again and again and again, people bump up against their emotions and it really hurts them as an investor. Um, certainly I've got some tricks, but you've been working with financial advisors and individuals for, for decades. I, I'd be interested in your thoughts as well. Yeah, I, again, uh, money is an emotional topic. I, I read a, uh, a report the other day, I, I should remember which institution it was from, but it talked about like over the last you know 15 years, uh, institutional balance portfolios had returned um, 8% compounded, obviously again, uh, balanced portfolio. And they compared that against the investor who's managing their own dollars. Uh, and they uh, had calculated a rate of, of 5% there. I think when it's your job and it's your responsibility and you have built a plan and there's a program in place and you have to follow it, uh, then you follow it. Uh, but it, it's it's almost like having a personal trainer. If you have that person, you've hired it, you're sitting down and meeting with them, you're going to make that appointment. If you don't have a plan like that in place, uh, you get to make uh, decisions in the moment based on how you feel. And sometimes you don't feel like working out. In a pandemic, sometimes you feel scared. And when you're scared and it's your money and it's emotional, uh, it, it's easy to make an emotional decision that in hindsight doesn't uh, always turn out to be correct. At least that's been uh, my experience. You agree with that? Yeah, you know, I, I do. And it circles again back to some of the media stuff is that the media often feeds on those emotions, right? And so, you know, Regardless of whether you lean left or lean right politically, chances are at some point there's a party in power at some level or a policy that you love or hate, right? And chances are that maybe, you know, if you're on the right, maybe you watch Fox News. If you're on the left, maybe you watch MSNBC. And most of the time, you're not necessarily getting a completely balanced view, right? They're, they're skewing one way or another, which can feed into your original thoughts. And so it's like if you think about an election, most people think every election, if one or the other party wins, is going to destroy the economy and the financial markets. I've heard for the last 20 years, every single election is the most important election the markets have ever faced, and it's never been true. Um, if you look at the data, right, and it's boring to say, go look at the actual, like the numbers and the data and, and the truth. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that markets have gone up under both Democrats and Republicans, right? And of course, me, I have my own views on politics, Dom, I'm sure you do too, just like everybody out there. But I think one of the keys to the success that professional investors have um, in addition to setting a plan and then following it in a regimented way is setting aside what they want to be correct and instead focusing on what is likely to be correct. You know, last election, I had views on which way I wanted it to go, but I didn't allow that to impact my views of how to invest client portfolios. It was more like, OK, if Biden wins or if the Democrats win the House or Senate, what's likely to happen if the Republicans, you know, same thing. Um, and the reality is, is that in most cases, there may be sectors or securities that benefit disproportionately under one party or another. Um, neither party historically has spelled disaster for markets. Um, and yet we routinely see people that abandon the market, pile in or out based on that. And I think that's just one example of letting what we want to come true and letting our emotions kind of take over. And then the media feeds into it and it becomes a vicious cycle where, again, sounds like a broken record. But if you put that plan in place, right, and then you step back, now you've got something, a piece of paper that you're required to follow. Um, 
you know, I think that's one of the benefits too um, of financial advisors. And this isn't a, a plug for pure financial. Obviously, we're financial advisors. But whoever your financial advisor is, assuming they're competent, well qualified, a fiduciary, et cetera, is that personal trainer analogy. It's they help you come up with a plan and then they help you stick to that plan. Um, I think that there's value to that to help guard you from your own emotions. Maybe final point on the topic from my perspective here, Brian, is that I think we're uh, human nature, we are. Uh, predisposition to, to hear what we want to hear. So I, I think those who are maybe feeling more uh, fear around a particular topic uh, 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 hear the negative or experience the fear a little bit more, which again sends them into a spot where you make uh, a more emotional decision. But the reality is, uh, you know, we, we can all hear the same message, but we can hear it uh, differently because we hear it through our own lens. Uh, and then we, we act on that differently. But again, I think the trouble is, is acting on emotion, like you're saying, rather than uh, than executing the plan. Yeah, you know, that, that's a great point. And, and I think the other part of it is simply that keep in mind the same news or the same event at different stages of life might lead to you to feel differently and act differently. Right. So a market crash, if you think about, um, let's say you're 60 years old right now. Right. And you're planning to retire in a couple of years. Um, you want to retire at 62. The late 90s uh, stock bubble and then the early 2000s crash, you were in your 40s. You might have viewed that as a buying opportunity where, hey, you know what? I'm in my peak earning years. I'm going to throw money at it and buy the dip while the market grinds along towards lows, right? Flash forward 10 years, you're pushing 50 during the 2008, 2009 crisis. Maybe you're really, really nervous. You're having some sleepless nights because now you've built up real wealth. Retirement's a dozen years out and you're seeing your, your future imperiled, right? So you're nervous, but maybe you don't take action. Now you flash forward another decade, it's 2020, stocks fall 35% with the coronavirus crisis. You're a couple of years out from retirement, you panic and sell, right? Three relatively similar events, obviously different causes, but relatively similar events and impacts on portfolios. Um, the reaction, the emotions, and the action you take from it, very different based on where you are in your financial journey. And I think it's important to be honest with yourself where you are in that journey and how you're going to feel because we meet a lot of people that feel like they can take a fair amount of risk because they didn't panic in the 90s or the 2000s or the 2010s or whatever it was, all of a sudden they're either approaching retirement or in retirement. That risk tolerance may not be what it was when they were younger because it's real now. You know what I mean? They're not working for money anymore. They need that portfolio to live off of. Seeing it disintegrate or fall apart um, has a very, very different impact. Yeah, another uh, interesting, interesting experience down that uh, path recently was uh, the most recent uh, elections, which I, you referenced as well. I'm not one who personally uh, follows politics that closely. It just candidly doesn't bring me energy. Uh, but the night of the presidential election, uh, for just out of pure interest, I was toggling back between what I perceived to be the most right wing versus the most left wing uh, news stations out there. And uh, at times I felt like they were uh, reporting on different events. Uh, yeah. It's just a, quite a different uh, lens. So uh, something to be thoughtful about too. Yeah, uh, completely. And it, it's the same internationally. I remember being, um, I forget where I was, I was somewhere in, in the Middle East at one point. This was several years ago. And um, whatever the news story was, our hotel um, had the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, or Journal. then they had the Financial Times, and they had um, Al Jazeera News Network was on and like the South China Post was on from Hong Kong or something. And it was the same story. And it was like four, it was like watching four different movies that were supposed to be the same movie. I mean, there were zero similarity between the stories and yet they all revolved around the same thing and were from um, theoretically reputable news sources. So I think it's always important as you consume information uh, to filter it through an understanding of what the, the outlet's agenda is for sure. Yeah, be careful. We naturally tune into the channel where we, uh, uh, where we want the message to be, uh, you know, it, running in that direction. So with that in mind, uh, looking ahead, so we've looked kind of rear view mirror uh, now. We've talked about kind of what makes us uh, make some of those decisions in the moment. Uh, now let's look ahead. What, uh, what do you think is in store for the market as you look out, you know, the run we've had over the last 18 months and you look ahead, you know, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, uh, where, where do you see it going? What's your what's your take on it? Uh, you know, I well, I talked about something in the very beginning of this thing about who's Batman and who's Robin. I'm going to be Robin and let you answer that one, Batman, <laughs> because that is a, a tough uh, that's a tough one. Um, 
you know, I, I wish I knew. I, the, the truth of the matter is, is I could give a very well-reasoned answer here. Um, and I could sound like I know everything. And honestly, I could make the argument for markets falling or going up. And I think I could sound pretty intelligent on either. And either would be a guess. I, I think um, when you start talking about a, a period of six months, a year, a year and a half, that's a really difficult time horizon. I, th I think what's easier than that is, hey, where do you think the market's going to be in three years or five years or 10 years where you can step back and take some sort of um, perspective? Um, you know, what I will say is this, is that I think it's important and, and I'll eventually answer the question, too. But I think it's important to define market. Right. Because even as financial professionals, so I, I lead the investment committee here and we'll talk about the market. We're as guilty of it as anybody. And we mean the S&P 500, but that's not the market. I mean, the S&P 500 is 500 companies. It's actually 505 companies, um, large companies in the United States with a tilt towards growth companies as opposed to value stocks. Right? The Dow Jones is another well-known index. It's 30 stocks. You know, there are something in the order of 3,500 publicly traded stocks in the United States, right? Just 30 stocks or 500 represent all of those? Probably not. You know, there's something in the order of 13 or 14,000 publicly traded stocks. If you look at Japan, Canada, um, Europe, uh, China, Russia, other emerging markets. So you're talking about tens of thousands of stocks represented by a, a couple hundred U.S. stocks. Um, and that's not to mention bonds, real estate, cash. And so I think it's really important that when we talk about the market, we get really specific on what we mean. And the, the reason I'm kind of teaching that lesson here is that it's pretty easy, I think, to make an argument that some parts of the U.S. stock market are relatively highly valued. I don't want to say that they're overvalued because they could keep going up. And frankly, six months ago or a year ago, I would have thought that we were due for a pause and we've continued to go up. Um, we've seen more volatility lately, um, but they're not cheap. No matter how you want to slice and dice it, it's hard to argue they're cheap, right? That doesn't mean they can't go up, but it, they're not cheap. But when you look at other parts of the U.S. market, like smaller U.S. companies, when you look at value stocks as opposed to growth stocks, um, when you look at a lot of international markets, Europe is extremely cheap. Japan's relatively inexpensive, um, not just compared to the U.S., but compared to historical norms. Emerging markets were the best performing asset class for much of the 2000s. Um, most people don't realize that the emerging market indexes are basically where they were a dozen years ago. So while the U.S. has had this huge run up, emerging markets, which are some of the fastest growing economies in the world and home to a lot of really dynamic companies, have essentially stagnated. So there's probably opportunity there. Um, it's so a long-winded way of saying that I don't know where the U.S. market is going to be over the next couple of years, but I feel pretty confident that if you kind of spread your positions around across different markets, there are going to be some winners in there that you can find. Certainly. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, in this recent trip to, to San Diego, I think it was two nights ago, I was getting a, a, a ride uh, from the office uh, back to my hotel with my Uber driver and, and got the, kind of the classic question of, uh, I think he was a paralegal by day wanting to go to law school and uh, was uh, looking for me to give him a, a bet on a single stock where he could make uh, you know a spike in profit over the course of the next 30 days and pay for his law school uh, it doesn't sound like that's a, a strategy you recommend uh i do but i don't tell everybody publicly yeah i mean that's tough right um it's possible i, I mean people made and lost fortunes in gamestop or amc or stuff like that at the beginning of the year um, there are trading strategies that can just generate untold profits, right? Um, the problem is, is that if you're wrong, it's not going to pay off, right? And here's the other thing is buying is one thing. When do you sell? You know, I'll tell you the truth. The best stock I ever bought, I made four times my money in about a year. I had the best individual stock, right? I felt pretty good about that until uh, about a dozen years later when I saw a story in Barron's that announced that the stock that I had owned in the last 15 years had been the best performing stock in the United States. And that my initial investment, instead of making Forex, would have been worth seven and a half million dollars. Right. <laughs> um, so it's like, yes, I did a victory lap because I made four times my money. I made a few bucks. I could have bought a new car with it or something like that. But the reality is I left seven and a half million dollars on the table. Right. And I'm supposedly a professional. So when do you sell? Would anybody have actually ridden that all the way from a relatively small investment to seven and a half million? So concentrated stock investing or investing in anything with a concentrated position. Um, the old saying is, is a good way to build wealth, but it's a tough way to keep wealth. Um, so really hard to do. You know, I also want to focus when it comes to investing, I, I think sort of linking back to something else that we talked about, which was inflation. And, and I think we've got a slide that shows um, some various scenarios because 
it's one thing to talk about what the economy is doing, right? And the economy, um, inflation, maybe it's higher, maybe it's lower. But really what you care about is what does that mean for you, right? And a lot of people are worried that higher inflation is going to destroy the economy, destroy the, destroy the financial markets. In fact, if you look at the numbers, and this chart goes back to the 1980s, which is when we have good data from. Um, so I know it excludes the 1970s with really high inflation, um, but it does have a lot of different inflation scenarios. And, and it looks at, okay, inflation is high and rising. Inflation is low but rising. Inflation's high and falling. Inflation's low and falling. And then at different asset classes. And what you can see is in almost every single scenario, almost every asset class has done okay. And I think what that speaks to is the power of markets. For all the time that we spend talking about who's going to win an election, what the economy is going to do, what's going to happen with inflation, this and that. The reality is, is that there is a tide in financial markets that's almost always moving forward. And if you're trying to get in and out, you're fighting the tide. Over time, markets go higher. Why do you want to swim against that? I, I mean, we all know people that like to make things more difficult than they need to be. I'm not one of those people. You know, have the plan and work the plan. I, uh, there was Andy's uh, opening poll there where she talked about, you know, who's who's watching the markets and trying to make the prediction. I, I, uh, I guess I applaud those 47%, I think it was, that yeah. said they, uh, they're, they occasionally, but not regularly, are turning to those uh, channels. Um, they're probably part of the plan to uh, keep the discipline in place to, to not uh, be caught up in the emotion. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you one of my favorite stories about how not being emotional um, can lead to success is that uh, I think it was Fidelity. It was one of the big custodians did a survey of all their clients. They had you know, millions and millions and millions of client accounts. And they segmented them by different cohorts. How old are people? How much money do they have? How long have they been investing? Um, what stage of life are they at, right? How actively do they trade a lot, a little? How often do they log on, et cetera, right? And then they said, okay, how have the different cohorts of people been, right? The second best investor class out of all of these different things, out of millions of accounts, was people that forgot that they had an account. The only group of investors they had that did better than the people that forgot they had an account was, do you want to guess, Tom? <laughs> Tell me. Clients that had passed away. Hmm. The best performing segment of their client base was those that had died because they weren't messing with their accounts, right? So it's hard to be less emotional than if you're dead, right? <laughs> We've all seen zombie <laughs> movies. Those, those zombies do not have a lot of emotion, right? When you remove the constant frenetic desire to do something, um, results turn out to be pretty good. Again, because it gets back to that upward momentum. And I think we have one more slide and it looks at the stock market. This is the Dow, which again, is not the best index in the world. It's just 30 stocks, but it goes back a long way from 1900. And if you think about along the way from 1900, all the different things we've seen, World War I, right? The war to end all wars for at least 30 years until we had World War II, right? We had stagflation. We had presidents assassinated. We had um, the, you know, the Cold War. We had communism. We had China and then we had China rising and then we had the dot-com boom and bust and et cetera, the financial crisis. And yet look at that chart. Over time, yes, there are ups and downs, but look at how over time there's that upward momentum leading markets higher. And if you're getting out, you better have darn good timing for when to get back in. Otherwise, you're swimming against the tide and it might be hard to catch up. The other thing I think is really instructive is that, Dom, and you've probably heard this a million times, right? Is, hey, I'm going to wait until things are more certain. There's too much uncertainty to invest right now. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, a time or two. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, when isn't the future uncertain, right? And so I always think back to 1962. Um, and we're coming up actually on October, October 1962. I don't know if anybody out there remembers where they were in October of 1962. And by the way, I haven't looked at the dates on this in a little while. So if, it's, if I'm off by a year or a month, I apologize, right? But I believe it was October 1962, 13 days, was the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? And it came out years afterwards that the Russian generals in Cuba had orders that if American, gen if American troops set foot on Cuban shore, they were to launch their nuclear weapons, right? It wasn't even known at the time just how close we were to all out nuclear war, right? The world was that close, right? We had kids hiding under flimsy wooden desks. Maybe some of you out there were hiding under desks, right? Because that's going to protect you from the nuclear bomb, right? Um, at the time, the Dow was at like 500. Right. Flash forward, it's at like 35,000 despite all the uncertainty. Do you think that somebody looking at the world in that moment when the world was on the brink of nuclear Armageddon would have said, wow, things are pretty clear. The lights are all green. I feel calm and comfortable. Let me invest. 
Probably not. But if they had done that, if they had said, well, the world's really uncertain, times are always uncertain, stocks go up over time, let me just buy and forget about it. Um, you know, it turned out pretty good. You know who kind of did that is, uh, if any of you have heard of Warren Buffett, right? I mean, he's been investing since then. And he's always kind of taken that view that, you know, things are going to happen good and bad, but he's going to invest, buy good companies for the long run and stay invested. And uh, last I checked it, it worked out pretty good for old Warren. Yeah. Hey, Brian, while we have the moment uh, talking about uh, returns in the stock market, why don't we do another poll? Yeah, I like that. OK, so I've got a poll. I'm going to put that up on screen right now. And it's in the next 10 years. What returns do you expect from the stock market? So and your options are 12 plus percent, 9 to 12 percent, 6 to 9 percent zero to 6% or negative returns. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave that poll up for a few minutes uh, and then uh, it's up to you guys. We have a number of questions from the audience that we can start taking now, or uh, if you would like to continue your conversation. Yeah, we could go to the uh, question. Let's see what the results of the poll come back. Um, you know, and when we say the market in this case, again, we're generalizing talking about just US stocks. Right. All right, so uh, I'm gonna leave this poll up for another couple of seconds. We're gonna close it up in five four, three, two. There is a little bit of a delay. So my counting may not actually match up with when the poll actually closes. So I'm leaving that up for a little bit longer and I'm going to close the poll right now. Uh, so right now, 9% of people believe that the market is going to do 12% or more. 18% says it's going to be nine to 12%. 57% of people say that it's going to be six to 9%. 12% say zero to 6% and 1% of the audience actually believes that the returns will be negative. Okay. Dom, what would your answer be? Well, my answer would be, I hope the 9% is right. They're the ones that said uh, 12 <laughs> or higher. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, we've talked a lot about the markets today. We've talked about a lot about market forces. Uh, but to me, the, the overarching theme that it keeps coming back to, and no matter how you get there is, is, is have a plan. Uh, funny. I, I, Think about it, you know, again, on the, on the parenting side of things, I feel like my, my kids in life have to build a plan uh, and then they have to have coping skills because things are going to happen. Emotions are going to get the best of you. You're going to have to overcome it and, and, and build a new plan. But uh, I, I think the answer is you have to have a plan that is going to get you through the good times and the bad times. We know the stock market goes up. We know the stock market uh, goes down. Uh, I wouldn't uh, uh, share with you a, my estimate from a percentage perspective. Uh, but to the comments you just made from uh, 500 to 35,000 uh, over the course of, uh, what was that, you know, 60 years, that's uh, pretty significant. Uh, the market goes up more than it goes down. So having some exposure in the market as part of your plan is, is something I would almost always recommend. How about yourself? Yeah, you know, uh, I don't know. If we're talking about the US stock market, I'd probably be in with the consensus there, the six to 9%. I think historical is 10. I'd probably say a notch under that kind of thing. Um, again, I, I also hope the 12% would be nice, but I, I would go with just a notch under there, that mid single digits. Um, you know, I think for the higher returns, I think emerging markets are maybe the place to go. Um, again, we, we could put all these in a time capsule and see who's right at the end. But, uh, but I, I do think people will be able to get reasonable returns. Um, you know, I also think that comparing returns to some market benchmark or some arbitrary number is probably a, a, a loser, losing game. Um, I think it's better is figure out what return you need to meet your goals, right? Do you need 4%? Do you need 9%? Whatever the number is, and then build a portfolio that'll get there and measure your performance to that plan and that return that you need, as opposed to some arbitrary market benchmark. Um, the S&P, folks, I hate to tell you, the S&P don't know or care what your financial goals are or whether or not you retire. You know what I mean? Figure out what return you need to retire or to do whatever it is you want to do. Build a portfolio that'll get you there. Um, Andy, yeah, I think uh, let's let's take some audience questions, make it interactive. All right. As a reminder, if you do have questions from what you've heard so far, just type them into the chat and we will get to as many of those as we can. So I'm going to start off with a basic question that came through because it's it's uh, it's uh, relevant to the conversation here. Can you please define equity markets? That's from Casey. Yeah, equity. Um, and that's a good question. Equity is just another word for stocks. So we're talking about stock markets like uh, Apple stock or, um, you know, McDonald's stock, whatever it is. We're talking about stocks. And Carlos would like to know, do you recommend pulling back on your equities allocation in the next few years? Uh, you know, no, in a vacuum, no. Um, again, I don't, I don't know the specific circumstances there, but no, I, I mean, I, I think it's about figuring out what, again, what the goal is, right? And what return is needed to meet the goal. 
If your portfolio is set up to get you the return you need without undue risk, there's no reason to pull back. Um, if you've taken a closer look and maybe you're all in stocks, right? And you realize you only need 7% or 6%, you know, maybe you don't need to be all in stocks. At that point, you would pull back. But I, I think pulling back would be a function of what, how your portfolio looks relative to the return you need, not a view of the, the market or anything like that. Ricky says, during times of uncertainty, are equal weight eight ETFs safer than non-weighted ETFs? Uh, <laughs> that is a, a very specific and, and good question. Um, unfortunately, the, the answer is it depends. You know, time will tell. It, it really depends on the environment. Um, if you think about it, and, and so just to clarify, most ETFs are exchange traded funds. So they, they track an index. And most of the well-known indexes like the S&P 500 are what's known as market cap weighted. So that means that the biggest companies have the largest weighting down to, let's say, so Apple might be five and a half or 6%. Microsoft might be 5%. The 500th biggest company in the S&P might have like a 0.01 or 0.2% weighting or whatever it is, right? So um, an equal weight just takes the 500 stocks and slices them equally. It depends, honestly, on, on what stocks are doing best or, or worst in any given environment. And that's not necessarily a function of um, how the index is constructed. It's the environment. Uh, 2019, 2020, big technology stocks were doing best. Um, and in the decline in, in March of 2020, they did the best. So in that environment, you would have wanted a market cap weighted because the higher technology weighting of those mega caps would have done better. Um, in the last year or two, my guess is a um, an equal weighting would have done better because smaller companies have have led the way. So it's, it's really um, environment specific. Casey says, do you see the devaluation of the dollar getting worse? Um, well, the dollar's actually done OK. Um, I actually wish the dollar would devalue a little bit because it would be good for international stocks. When you live in the U.S. and you own international stocks, a weaker dollar is actually good for the value of your holdings. Um, and in the last several years, the dollar has actually hung in there pretty good. Um, you know, currencies tend to fluctuate in, in large kind of cycles. We don't have a, a chart up for it right now. But if you look like the dollar was strong for a decade and then in 1985, um, a bunch of central bankers met in New York and, and passed the Plaza Accords because it was at the Plaza Hotel. And then the dollar fell a bunch and then the dollar rose in the 90s and then fell in the 2000s. It goes in these big cycles. Um, I think the key to remember is we, we could sit here all day and talk about the problems the U.S. faces, right? And depending on your political view or your, your worldview, um, you, you might have different thoughts. But, you know, the U.S. obviously has challenges. But currency values are relative, right? It's not in a vacuum. It's the dollar versus something. So it's like, all right, what do you want instead of the U.S. dollar? I mean, Europe? Well, Europe's not exactly free from problems, right? Do you want the Chinese yuan? That's always a popular one for taking over as the world's reserve currency. Um, they're busy, you know, in a lot of ways, quashing capitalism and singling out companies to go after. So I'm not sure that right now you want the yuan instead of the dollar, right? And Japan, okay, well, you could buy the Japanese yen, but the Japanese yen, you know, J Japan has horrible demographics, et cetera. So um, that's not necessarily a short-term forecast for the dollar, um, but I think it's important to remember that while the U.S. has problems, so do other countries, and it's all relative. And I don't see anything that would say that the dollar, could it weaken? Sure. But is there anything saying, hey, the dollar should collapse right now? Well, not that I see. Uh, S says, are Series I savings bonds a good investment to combat inflation? Um, they could be. Um, so Series I uh, savings bonds, you, you basically buy them through your bank and they're linked to uh, inflation. Um, if you think inflation is going to go higher, you would rather have Series I bonds or inflation-linked bonds than, than non-inflation-linked bonds. Um, the two things I would say is, one is, a lot. you can also buy them. They're known as TIPS. Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. They're the same concept, but they trade in public markets. You can buy them um, from a brokerage firm. You can buy them. There are also ETFs and mutual funds that hold them. Um, that might be a more liquid and kind of easier wrapper to hold it in than just going to the bank and buying the, uh, the I-bonds. Um, so that's one thing to consider. The other is that, yes, in a vacuum, if inflation's going up, um, those bonds can do okay. But keep a couple things in mind. First, um, the, the value of them resets with rises in actual inflation. Um, so if you think inflation is going higher or if interest rates are going higher because inflate because of worries about inflation, those bonds can actually do very poorly. You need actual inflation ratings to go up for the bonds to perform. Um, and so just keep that in mind. I think sometimes people lose sight of that. The other is that if you really think inflation is going higher, um, yeah, you might want some of those. 
But there are other investments that would also do reasonably well, right? Um, international stocks will often do okay. Natural resources companies tend to do okay in an inflationary environment. And even good U.S. stocks tend to do okay because, you know, a lot of them have pricing power, right? Um, Dom's example, right? If McDonald's has inflation, I mean, they already have inflation, right? 22 <laughs> bucks for a Happy Meal. If they raised the price to $23, his daughter probably still would have gotten her uh, value, her value meal, right? Her $23 value cheeseburger. Um, so good companies have pricing power and can withstand a fair amount of inflation. So a lot of times, um, if you have an intermediate term time horizon, stocks can still make some sense in an inflationary environment. Steve says, how come you guys don't talk about precious metals as investments? Um, well, we could. I mean, sometimes we should do a whole thing on it. That would be interesting. We probably get a, we probably get a lot of viewers. Um, here's the challenge with precious metals is that um, I, I think that there are two issues. Um, one is simply that we don't know how to value them. And what I mean by that is the way that we value investments um, is not to sound boring, but we discount cash flows to net present value. And if you think about it, if a company is building a factory, they're going to say, how much is it going to cost to build? And then how much revenue is it going to generate? And what's that worth? And it's the same thing with a stock or a bond or whatever. You say, all right, it kicks off this much cash flow. How risky is it? And what is that cash flow worth to me today? So it's math, right? You may or may not be right, but it's a math exercise. Precious metals don't generate any revenue. Um, so what you're turning to is it's more of a trading exercise where it's psychology. You're saying, what will somebody else say that this is worth a six months from now or five years from now, right? Um, and now it's just a different exercise. It's not math, it's psychology. It doesn't make it good or bad. It's just different. Um, the second reason we don't, we don't talk about them a lot and, and why we don't own them in portfolios is I've never figured out how to position it in a portfolio. And, and what I mean by that is, most people buy precious metals in a portfolio because if you get really bad outcomes, high inflation, deflation, you know, political turmoil, that the precious metals tend to do good, right? Okay, fine. So if the U.S. government collapses or we get 10% inflation or we get deflation and half my portfolio is in gold, I'm going to do good with that half of my portfolio. But if none of those outcomes happen, that gold is going to be a huge drag on my portfolio. So instead, I just want 5 or 10% of my portfolio in gold. Well, now, great, if all the bad outcomes happen, I have 5 or 10% of my portfolio in gold. But honestly, if everything else is sucking wind and 5% is doing good, who really cares? So I don't know how you size it in a portfolio so that if a scenario comes about where gold performs well, you have enough to make a difference. But if that scenario doesn't happen, it's not an anchor on a portfolio. Um, I, I haven't figured that out yet. I mean, Dom, have, have, have you come across precious metals a lot? <clears throat> Yeah, it's a it's a tricky one, one that I would uh, stay away from. I remember uh, rather than you know just simply reading the data on it, uh, <clears throat> I don't I forget how many years ago this was 12, uh, 13, 14 years ago. Um, I I put some money in a uh, in a gold fund, a long fund, and a short fund, and uh, just to just to watch how they would operate, and then kind of track closely to it. And some of the the costs in holding those contracts within the ETFs are so significant. I remember the fund that was uh, the short fund, uh, gold actually went down and the fund didn't gain value. Uh, so, it, you know, part of it too, is it's just a little bit of a less efficient market and a little bit harder to get, uh, in and out of with, and we're always trying to keep, a, an eye on costs. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, not something I, uh, you know, since some of the experience have had a lot of, uh, experience with and, and just kind of uh, steer clear of. Yeah. I'm going to put up one more poll. Uh, which I'm going to do right now. And that poll is, when it comes to managing my money, I am excellent. In that case, you have a clear strategy and execute with discipline. Or if you're being honest, you need to hire a financial advisor and devote more time to it. So I'm going to leave that poll up right now. Let us know where you stand on that. Do you think you're in excellent shape or do you need to actually spend a little bit more time on your financial plan? So that's up on screen right now. Wow, right now it's at about 50-50. I'm going to leave it up for a couple more seconds. Five, four, three, two. I'm going to close this poll up now. And the answer is, we have 
60% believe that they need to devote more time to it and hire a financial advisor. 39, oh, now it's 39% say excellent. They have a clear strategy and they execute with confidence and discipline. So that uh, tells me that that 60% of people have some work to do. About half of you said that you could use some help. So congratulations for taking that first step. With so many changes to taxes and retirement savings in the works in Congress, now is the best time to schedule a one-on-one -on -one comprehensive financial assessment with one of the certified financial planners here at Pure Financial Advisors. It's an online video meeting via Zoom. It's free and nobody is going to sell you anything. Pure Financial is a fee-only fiduciary financial planning firm. We don't sell investment products and we are required by law to act in the best interests of our clients as a fiduciary. You can click the link and choose the day and time that works best for you. But remember that the calendar is filling up quickly. So you'll want to schedule that free assessment right away. And that is all I've got for you today. Unless either of you gentlemen have anything else that you'd like to add. No, you know, the only thing I would throw out is um, those financial assessments. I, I believe we're doing 105 of them this week alone. Um, so the schedules are pretty tight. This is our busiest time of year because of year end tax planning. We're really this has been an investment seminar, obviously, but we're really tax focused. Um, if you've been keeping track of some of the proposals coming out of Washington, as you can imagine, in addition to year end tax planning, there's also a lot of um, surge in interest around what's going to happen with capital gains and ordinary income and some changes to potentially how to get money into Roth accounts that has been proposed and stuff. So um, if it's something that you're interested in, I'd, I'd suggest signing up sooner rather than later because the schedule is pretty jam packed. Um, you know, again, I, I think that taking a look for, not only at the investments, but at the taxes can, can add a lot of value, especially in a year where we're seeing some pot potentially significant changes in taxes. All right. Thank you both very, very much for joining us.